So on in-class buoyancy, question number one, it says, a block with a density of 650 kilograms per cubic meter is floating in fresh water. The dimensions of the block are 0 0.25 meters by 0 0.15 meters and 0 0.1 meter high. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. How far below the surface will the block be? So this was the picture we drew on Friday. I tried to put some dimensions to it, like three dimensions to it, because it's 0.25 meters wide by 0.25 meters long by 0.1 meters high. So it's not completely underwater. It's asking us how far underneath the water is it. When we talk about forces, we have my buoyant force that's pointing upwards. It's an upward force. And we have our gravitational force pulling down. So we will have to use Newton's second law. When we go through and we try to solve for this H, that's what we're trying to figure out is how much of this is underwater, how deep underwater is it. It's not all 0 .01, 0 0.1, we're trying to figure out how far. So that, this H is solved for in this part of my buoyant force equation. When we talk about my buoyant force, it's times the volume that's being displaced. This volume being, being displaced is the volume that's underneath water. And I tried to show that with my purple cross lines. That's how much of my block is underneath the water. The volume of that block, rectangular prism, assuming it's floating nice and level in the water, is equal to the length that's underneath the water times the width that's underneath the water times the height. It's the length underwater times the width underwater times the unknown H underwater. That's in here. That's where we're going to get to that. But before we can do that, let's figure out our F of G. So F of G is M times G, but I'm not nice enough to say it's a five kilogram block or a 10 kilogram block. I just said, hey, it's got a density of 650 kilograms per cubic meter. But our density equation is equal to, density is equal to mass divided by volume. So if I'm talking about the density of the block, this would be the mass of the block times the volume of our block. And if we know any two of those numbers, we can solve for the third. The density of the block was given at 650 kilograms per cubic meter. The volume of the block wasn't given, but I gave you the dimensions. This is the total density of the block. This is the total mass of the block, which means this is going to be the total volume of the block. So it would be the length times width times the height for that total volume. So the density is 650 is equal to the mass, and I'll specify that's of the block, divided by the length of that block, 0 0.25, times the width of that block, 0 0.15, times the height of that block, which is 0 0.1. So, 650 is equal to M of the block over 0 0.00375. That's the total volume of the block. Cross multiply and divide the mass of this block is going to be 2.4375 kilograms. That's the mass. It's a pretty common calculation I'm going to ask you to do. If I give you the density, I give you the dimensions, you should be able to figure out the, the mass of this block. Now, in our free body diagrams, we don't put mass. We put m times g, because that's what f of g is, is m times g. So when you take that and you multiply by 9.8, we're going to get a value of 
0.875 newtons. And I'm going to keep all the decimals. I often only write two and I use all, all of them, but I'll write all four of them. So the weight, the F of G of this block, is 23.8875 newtons. So now we know F of G. Then, using Newton's second law, Newton's second law says the sum of all my forces is equal to F net, which is equal to mass times acceleration. And if we say that's equal to mass times acceleration, we should then be talking about what are, what's true about my velocity. If a block is floating on the surface, is my velocity constant or is it changing? It's constant. So that tells me my acceleration is zero or not zero. It's going to be zero. So this is zero, which means this is zero. Something I think it's safe to say is for our situations is going to be the case. Some of my forces says I add my ups. So I add all the forces that have an arrow pointing upwards. F of B is the one and only force pointing up. I subtract all my downs. There's one and only one, and that's F of G, and then that's equal to zero. That's Newton's second law. Add my ups, subtract my downs. Because again, we're trying to solve for this H, and this H is hidden in this volume that's being displaced. How much of it is underwater is hidden in that volume that's being displaced. So my buoyancy equation is the density that's being displaced. What's being displaced? What's getting pushed out of the way when we put a block in water? Is the water getting pushed out of the way or is the block getting pushed out of the way? The water is getting pushed out of the way. So this is the density of water times the volume that's being displaced. Okay. Now, when we talk about the volume that's being displaced, it's what are the dimensions that are underneath the water. Okay? It's specifically the dimensions that are underneath that water. Times G. And then that's minus F of G, which is equal to zero. And it sure would be nice if we get F of G to the other side, so that's a minus. We would have to add F of G to both sides, but hopefully you're okay with me adding F of G and then A. There's my equation. Because we know that number. We calculated that number. Now, we start plugging the numbers in. The density of water was given to be 1,000. It's times the dimensions that are underneath the water. So it's times this dimension, 0 0.025 because it's underwater, times this dimension because 0 0.51 meters is underwater, times h, because that's only that much is underwater. So it's 0 0.25 times 0 0.15 times h, because h, length times width times height, that's the shaded section of my block. And a common mistake that we often forget about after we put that h in, it's still got a times g, there's still that times 9.8 which is equal to FG, F of G, which we already calculated to be 23.8875. So 1,000 times 0.25 times 0.15 times H times 9.8 is 365. I'm sorry, 367.5 H, which is equal to 23.8875. Make sure you divide the right number. It's 367.5 times H, so to get H by itself, we need to make sure we divide by the 367.5 Sometimes we forget about it. We always just divide the big number by the, the small number, but that's not the case. We've got to get H by itself. And when we go through and we take 23.8875 and we divide
divide by our 367.5, we get h to be a height of 0 0.065 meters. So of this 0 .1, 0 0.1 meters, 0 0.065 of it is underneath the water. So a quick double check, that number needs to be less than this. If for some reason, you got a number like 4, 8, 12, something's wrong because you only have 0 0.1 meters to start with. So that's a pretty common question that I'll ask is like how far underwater is it? And when we ask that, that H, that how far underneath water is hidden in this volume that's being displaced. It's the shaded portion of my picture. I think drawing this picture helps. That's why I draw it. That's why I shade it. That's why I label it, because I think it's beneficial. So that's a pretty common how far underwater. There's a couple types of questions for these buoyancy. This is a pretty common one. Part B of it is a pretty common part B of it, too. So part B is still using the 650 kilogram per cubic meter box. It's still using the 0 0.25 meters by 0 0.15 meters by 0 0.1 meter tall block. It's still using water. But the question now is, how much stuff can I put on it before I swamp? Now the reason I'm, I'm very specifically using the word swamp because on a homework sheet I'm going to give you, that's what the question is worded. It's like a canoe. It's kind of a term that they use canoeing sometimes. Like if you swamp a canoe, basically you fill the canoe full of water and it's taking on water. So that's, that's that idea. Okay. So this is part B of it. It's still the same dimensions of this block. It's still in fresh water. The difference is I'm going to start stacking stuff on it. And every time I put more stuff on it, it gets lower in the water and lower in the water and lower in the water. And eventually I put so much stuff on it that it's like at that point of the water coming over the edge or it does start coming over the edge. And it doesn't really matter. We're, we're at that like threshold is the idea. So my free, free body diagram is very similar to the one over there. I still have a buoyant force because my block is still immersed in a fluid. I still have an F of G. Now I'm going to specify what this F of G is. This F of G is the weight of the block. This is the F of G of the block. Now, did the dimensions of this block change from part A to part B? Did the density of this block change from part A to part B? So did the mass of this block change from part A to part B? So did the FG of this block change from part A to part B? And the answer to all of those, hopefully I remember the questions that I asked, everything's the same. The dimensions are the same, the density is the same, which means the mass is going to be the same, and the force of gravity of that block are going to be the exact same. Your canoe doesn't weigh more when you put stuff in. You are now in it, therefore there's more weight in it. But we can address that separately by saying, well, now there's another F of G, and in this case, it's what I'm just very nicely going to call, or generically say, stuff. So we have to take the FG of the stuff in the canoe, or on this raft, or on this block, and now we're trying to figure out how much stuff can this block carry. So, it's still floating. It's not going to be accelerating downwards. So it's still going to be a Newton's second law problem. It's still going to be the sum of all my forces is equal to F net 
is equal to mass times acceleration. It's still not accelerating. It still has no net force. So I add my ups, f of b. Now this f of b is going to have a different value than that f of b. And the reason why that f of b is going to have a different value than this one is if we look at the shaded portion here versus over there, the volume that's underwater is different. So because the volume, how much of it's underwater is different, the buoyant force is going to be different, just to be aware of that. There's one buoyant force minus the FG of the block. I add my ups, I subtract my downs. And I have to subtract my FG of the stuff that I put on it, which is equal to zero. That's my Newton's second law that I have to build specific for this object. The buoyant force is it's the density that's being displaced. So it's the density of what's getting pushed out of the way. It's still water. It's the density of water times the volume that's being displaced. So it's the volume, how much of it is underwater. It's my dimensions that are underwater. And in this case, all of them are going to be underwater, just so we're aware of it times g minus fg of the block. I don't need to recalculate that because it's the exact same fg as over there. And this is minus fg of the stuff. This is what we're solving for, and it's a minus. So might as well isolate that variable that we're solving for. And it's minus fg, so if you go to the other side, I add it. So if I, add, if I have a negative fg and I add it to the other side, it just becomes equal to fg of the stuff. We start plugging numbers in. It's a thousand times zero point two five times zero point one five times zero point one times nine point eight. This times this times this, those are the three dimensions that are under the water. So because those are the three dimensions that are under the water, we want to make sure that we multiply by those. Then minus the FG of the block, which was 23.8875, which is equal to FG of our stuff. Okay. I know, I apologize, I got pretty low on that board. So, I'm just going to draw an arrow and I'm going to move it up to the top. My buoyant force is different because more of it is underwater than it was before. It is now, if it's swamped, it's completely underwater. So, when we go through and we take a thousand, times 0.25, times 0.15, times 0.1, times 9.8, we get a buoyant force that's 36.75 minus my gravitational force of the block, which is 23.8875, which is equal to Fg of the stuff. So we take 36.75 minus 23.8875 and we get an FG that's equal to 12.8625 newtons. This is the FG of the stuff we can put on that block before we swamp it or we make it go into water. You want to make sure that you answer the question being asked. Is it asking for the weight? Is it asking for the force of gravity? Is it asking for the mass? Is it asking for kilograms? Or is the wording not descriptive enough or clear enough that either of them would be acceptable? And in this particular question, it just says how much stuff 
can be placed on it. So how can we measure how much stuff? I'd say newtons would be appropriate. Kilograms would also be appropriate. This question wasn't worded specifically enough that I'd say either of them would be acceptable. If it was more clear, it says what is the mass of the stuff or how many kilograms can we put on it? Then just remember that our FG of our stuff is equal to the mass of the stuff times G. And we could solve for this if we plug that in. We could. I'm not going to do it, but it's a doable calculation. Just divide by 9.8, and that'd give you the mass of the stuff that this block can hold. So the buoyancy is probably one of the trickier parts of this unit. When we do buoyancy, we're going back to Newton's second law. We're going back, oops, sorry. We're going back to adding my ups, subtracting my downs. I'm doing some stuff with FGs. So they take some getting used to. This is not the only type of buoyancy calculations we can do, but it's a starting of buoyancy calculations that we can start to do. So this is a homework sheet that you are not ready, probably not ready to complete, but you should be able to do questions one and two. Questions one and two are similar to the ones that I did with you. So the idea here is for you to try these um, and not have me talk at you the entire class period going through problem after problem after problem and say, okay, now go try them. This is a specific type of buoyancy problem, so now I want to give you the opportunity to practice these types of buoyancy problems. So number one is how far below water, and then A and B is we're changing the fluid, fresh water versus salt water. Number two A is very similar to the problem that we did on the board, and on the right-hand side. And then two B is how many kilograms of gear so how much stuff can we put on this canoe before they swamp it? That's where I added swamp to that worksheet. Now, 2B is very specifically saying how many kilograms. So when you get to 2B, I'm not asking for F of G. I'm very specifically asking for how many kilograms. I'm asking for the mass. So just make sure you address that. So with your time today, I would ask that you work on problems one and two. If you finish that, you're in good shape. You can kind of start trying the next ones if you want, but they're kind of new variations to buoyancy problems. This kind of gives you the opportunity to practice this type before we add the next type and the next type. Of this. So let me know what questions I can answer. I, this is not in Canvas yet. Um, I'm not ready for you to turn it in yet. Um, so. It's not there yet, but it will be eventually.